Yeah, just going to talk about what pulse wave velocity is and why we want to measure it in the brain. Um, and then we can present some results from um, from two different studies. Just say we're we're hitting that. So, um, so I think uh, phys the physiologists or exercise physiologists will know what pulse wave velocity is very very well. It's a what they mean is a sort of systemic measure of um, where you measure the, the pulse delay from the, uh, for example, the carotid artery to um, the femoral artery. You look at the, the delay in the pulse arrival and the pulse wave velocity is the path length divided by that delay. And yeah, as I said, it's a sort of key measure of cardiovascular health. What we want to establish is, is it a really useful of measure of cerebrovascular health as well? And it's interesting in, in the brain because, uh, like Yaka said earlier, in the brain, you've got the, the skulls incompressible. Um, so you have some very different hydrodynamics going on. Um, our direction really is to look at pulse wave velocity, to look at arterial stiffness in the brain. So, uh, so we've got, we've got this model where you've got the, the pulse wave comes into the brain and through arterial compliance, the pulse wave is attenuated. So by the time it gets into the microvasculature, uh, the, the pulse effectively goes to a steady flow. Um, and then we think that when you have arterial stiffness, so for example, in, in, in aging or other in pathologies, then to this, the pulse wave is not attenuated as well. So it actually starts to go into the microvasculature, which can cause tissue damage. But important point here is MRI is um, so valuable here because traditional measures um, of pulse wave velocity essentially use like optical measures or uh, pressure measures, which you don't have the depth to resolve within the skull. So with MRI, we've got some lovely measures to look at effectively flow in uh, within the, the brain intracranially. Um, so the approach we, we're taking is um, to look at the inflow signal. So if you have a, sort of a very short TR acquisition, so you're suppressing all the static background signal, effectively fresh, as fresh blood flows into the slice, uh, you, you see the signal of that blood. If it's fast enough to pass through the slice within a single TR, so it only hits, sees one excite, then you get a, a blood volume weighted signal. However, if it's slightly slower and um, it's slow enough, so with, for its passage through the slice, it hits multiple excites, you get a blood flow uh, related signal. So the more attenuated, the slower it is. So then you end up with this sort of two regime system with this inflow. So you've got these very short TRs. Um, if you have blood flow, um, if the blood flow velocity is greater than a certain velocity, which is the slice thickness divided by the TR, then um, that's this regime where you imagine it only hits C1 excite, so you have blood volume related. But what we're interested um, is the actual the flow sensitive regime, and forgive me, the, um, there's an error here, it should be the velocity, uh, flow velocity of the blood is less than this critical velocity. And we get this inflow, uh, flow sensitive. Um, and that's what we're interested in here with uh, what we're turning Dynamax signal, which is this dynamic inflow magnitude contrast signal. And so, um, Joe Whitaker and Kevin, Kevin Murphy uh, proposed this um, years ago. Um, where, and they sort of showed some nice signals where you look at, where you, you see this sort of um, lin linear flow dependence. So you're able to image in sort of large intracranial arteries, some, the, the flow, and you can see a nice pulse wave for, and the important thing here is the key, key bit here is that we're resolving the um, the pulse on a beat by beat basis. We're able to resolve individual heartbeat responses. Um, 
just, yeah, if we get, for example, a, in this regime, we're looking at a sort of single slice with a very short T, TR. So this is uh, short TR EPI. Um, so you get one slice in the carotid, and then uh, if we can get another slice higher up the vascular tree. So in this in this case, in the middle cerebral artery. And then for pulse wave velocity, the key bit here is to look at the the, the relative delay in the in the arrival of the pulse wave at, at each point. And then, like I said before, the pulse wave velocity is the the path length divided by that delay. Um, the path length here we we get from um, effectively re reducing the sort of time of flight down to a spine point, uh, down to a spine, and just tracking in, in three dimensions the the path from the two between the two slices. Now, because we're requiring two two slices, we're not actually um, effectively require one slice and then another. We're not lining up the exact same pulse for the um, internal carotid and the MCA. So we need an um, independent reference point. <laughs> for this, we, at the moment, we're using the uh, finger pulse ox. So we're looking at the delay for when the inflow signal arrives at, for example, the carotid artery to when it then arrives at the finger pulse. And then we use that as an independent point and look at the, the relative delay to the finger pulse between the carotid and the MCA to get this delay. But, um, I think important point to note here is so, for example, with um, like 4D flow phase contrast measures, we can also measure this uh, the the pulse waveform. However, that has to be averaged over many heartbeats. So over so it takes several minutes to acquire. So we're looking at hundreds of heartbeats, and when we look at these key timing dynamics, um, you actually blur out by averaging over these um, heartbeats. You kind of blur out the response. So it, uh, I come up. But yeah, so I shall come to it now. So I've mentioned it. So the key bit here is this, this lead edge, the, the onset of the pulse. Um, and sometimes, especially with 45, where you trigger based on the peak, not on the onset, sometimes I feel we can be blurring out that lead edge a bit. Now, yeah, so just an example of our, our data this is it's to get. This short, so 15 millisecond EPI, two millimeter, two millimeter, it's like 100, um, 100 by 100 matrix. It has to be quite heavily oversampled. So it obviously affects the, the data quality, but um, it still gives some nice signal around the, the blood vessels we're interested in. So in this case, the internal carotid and the middle cerebral artery. To get the delay calculations, which we fit a, a furry series, so we got five pairs of sine co cosines, um, different frequencies across the, the cartbeat from one one period to five periods, and then we use those to fit the um, where the the onset time starts. We apply this both for the pulse ox and for the the dime at the MRI, the measure at the, at the carotid or the MCA, and that's how we get our timings. So for the results, so as I said, we um, placed data to do different studies. First was in seven um, young, healthy female participants. And we got the we look at a delay between the carotid and the MCA, found a, a 15 millisecond delay. Um, this translates to a pulse wave velocity of 9.7 <laughs> meters per second. And to put this into context with the literature, so these sort of systemic measures from the carotid to the femoral, uh, they're looking at this sort of range. We're looking about sort of six to ten meters per second in a young, healthy cohort. And then the, the second study is was in a, an older cohort, so effectively the, the means about sixty-five years old. And important point here is to note that the curves so compared to the younger cohort. Where you've got um, a slope, it's a bit. I forget. It's a bit confusing here because we're looking at a delay to the pulse ox. A a larger delay effectively means you're looking at an earlier time point. So the, the higher values here means the carotid is earlier than the MCA. Whereas in this case, um, everything's a lot flatter. It is. You've still got the case where it leads the 
across the leads the MCA, albeit in I think it's about two of the subjects doesn't, but the the values are a lot lower. Um, so the effect of this is a limitation of course wave velocity here that we've got when the values get um, a lot closer to to zero effectively the the delay then is the denominator so you, you have noise really scaling up so it means it's a lot a lot of these values so for example in in this older cohort have a delay less than five milliseconds so the impact there is you get unphysiological um, estimates of the pulse wave velocity of maybe over 100 meters per second. And that's just that's measurement noise. That's just where we are at the moment in in this measurement. However, what we can do is take across the whole group with the um, five millisecond delay compared to 15 millisecond in the younger group, um, and then apply that with the the mean path length. And then we can get a sort of mean pulse wave velocity of about 20 meters per second. And again, referring to the systemic um, pulse wave velocity literature, that's consistent with an older group of this sort of age. So really, as I mentioned before, we, we've got this, uh, this new measurement of MRI, instead of looking at systemic pulse wave velocity, look at sort of card, starting to look at cerebrovascular health and how the pulse wave um, well, really uh, goes into the, into the brain, but from putting for arterial stiffness, um, comparing to the previous literature um, outside of the brain, we, we've got this measure where we're getting values that are on the right order. But as I said, there's a, a lot of variability in our measurements at the moment, and we're working on some uh, sort of different analysis techniques and acquisition techniques to really improve this and get get these value well it's really to get the sensitivity to an area where this can be a, a useful tool so yeah for example one one area that um we're working on recently all the all the data i'm showing to you today is comparing the internal carotid to the middle cerebral artery but it turns out the middle cerebral artery actually has a, a lot higher flow velocity than the internal carotid so as a result we actually think we're we're drifting out of the flow sensitive regime and into the volume sensitive regime. An example here just showed if you look at the dynamics of the curves, where the, the carotid has uh, almost a linear recovery after the, the pulse onset, the MCA flattens out. I think that's evidence that we're really hitting this um, peak. So within the pulse, so the, the mean the mean pulse is actually within the flow sensor regime, but because you have the dynamic range, the systolic part of the the time uh, time series actually it starts clipping. So um, in the short term, our, our response to that is to look at a different fast a different area. So instead, look at the anterior cerebral artery, which has similar flow profiles to the um, internal carotids, and we're only in sort of one subject, but we're getting some initial promising data and the data quality, it's only one subject, but it looks a lot better than in the MCAs. So that's an area we're going to, to move into. Um, yeah, so really focus today is just to present we, that we've got this new method to show we're really focusing on looking at sort of arterial stiffness and new measures of arterial stiffness in, in the brain and how it, it changes, for example, with aging um and you know the methods at an early stage but we've got some promising initial results but there, there's definitely work to be done here so yeah, i just want to thank the funders um definitely acknowledge sort of joe whitaker um who along with kevin really came up and conceived all these ideas it's really those driving it along and then everyone else and murphy that so thank you very much